we're delighted to have a, we're delighted to have a number of people who'd offer to uh, um, present their pecha kuchas. Um, a pecha kucha, Japanese term that I guess means something like chit chat. And so they're intended to be relatively short and sweet presentations. It, it's the basic idea is 20 slides for 20 seconds each. Um, sometimes with our own photographic pecha kuchas, people would put more than one image on a slide. So it might look a little bit faster for a few of them, but they shouldn't exceed about six minutes and 40 seconds. We'll have an intro slide. So around seven minutes piece is what we're looking at. Um, you do have an opportunity to chat. There's a chat feature in Zoom where people can make comments or ask questions. We're going to ask that everyone save discussion, full discussion or questions till the end of the presentations. So you might make note of those questions or issues you like to talk about further with the presenters. I'm going to ask everybody to please mute for now. Presenters, when it's time for you to go, please remember to unmute yourself um, so we can move appropriately. We have, uh, we have a great board for the Cuyahoga Photo Society, and they looked long and hard to find a moderator that was uh, eloquent, informative, and probably good looking. They couldn't find anybody like that, so they ended up with me. So here we go. Um, this is our Pecha Kucha 2021, and our first presentation is going to be from Bob Davis talking about the water all around us. Bob. Thank you, Steve. Um, I am one of the folks that has multiple photos on many of my slides. So don't be alarmed if some of them seem to only be up for, you know, six to 10 seconds. Um, and uh, with that, uh, let's get started. Humans are drawn to water, whether it's flowing, cascading, frozen, or suspended in the air around us, we seek it out and marvel at the beauty in it. As photographers, we seek to capture this beauty in ways that are somehow unique to us and our vision. For a familiar landmark like Brandywine Falls, that might mean an early autumn morning long exposure from a vantage point on the side opposite the viewing platforms, or a very fast exposure in the dead of winter to freeze the power and chaos of the tumbling water. It might mean a hike to a quieter destination like Lower Brandywine Falls just downstream from its big sister and yet just difficult enough to reach that you might have it all to yourself for hours at a time while visitors swarm the larger icon upstream. Or it might be a destination that requires even more exploring like this seasonal waterfall carrying snow melt toward Tinker's Creek in the Bedford Reservation. Whatever the subject though, capturing what you truly hope to find often requires repeated visits at different times of day, under different lighting and weather conditions or in different seasons throughout the year. Just a few minutes in the same spot can provide vastly different opportunities to capture a subject or can even provide different subjects like this sunrise at Hudson Springs Park that briefly offered a chance to catch a kayaker enjoying the tranquility of the morning. Catching a light dusting of snow early in the morning before it can be trampled by later arriving visitors or melt off in the late morning sun can make all the difference. As can waiting for that really deep freeze. I probably have hundreds of photos from Viaduct Park in Bedford in my collection, but sometimes all of those visits turn out to be practice for capturing that one favorite photograph. After an unsuccessful attempt to reach and shoot a different frozen waterfall before dark, I stopped by the Great Falls of Tinker's Creek at dusk on a winter's evening and was, re and was rewarded with a brilliant cloak of blue light over the frozen waterfall about eight minutes after sunset. Sometimes though, the absence of color can provide the best showcase for a subject, whether at full flow or after downpour or as Alicia Veo, Queen Anne Falls in Lake County offers a palette of mostly browns and grays in the winter.
And sometimes what you thought was the subject of your photo leads you to something a little more interesting, like the reflection of pines and cedars on the surface of Lake Irene in Rocky Mountain National Park, or these long dead tree trunks bleached and cracked by the sun, or a detail of Lower Dundee Falls in the Beach City Wilderness area near Strasburg, Ohio. Only someone intimately familiar with this waterfall would be able to identify it from this photo. Waterfalls provide nearly endless possibilities for photography as they change with the seasons, the amount of flow, the lighting, and the angle from which they're shot. This is Dundee Falls on a different branch from Lower Dundee Falls from the previous slide, as shot from above, from a ledge roughly midway down the ravine, and from the base of the waterfall, offering three very different perspectives to agonize over when attempting to choose a favorite. Even when water isn't the subject, it can often make a photograph more interesting, such as when dew or rainwater drapes the petals of an orange day lily or white trillium or orange jewelweed or a flat top white aster or when mist blankets the prairie of wildflowers at Springfield Bog Metro Park. It often pays to visit the subject throughout the seasons as well. This 40-foot waterfall at Days Dam in the Black River Reservation in Lorain County offers fairly consistent flow, but provides drastically different opportunities for composition based on the season. Sometimes, as impressive as the, as the waterfall may be, it can be just be used as a nice background. A little exploration can be useful as well. This 15-foot waterfall is just downstream from the one in the previous photos, but it's not visible from the trail when there are leaves on the trees. It's not as large and doesn't flow as strongly as its upstream cousin, but when I visit this park, more often than not, this is the waterfall I'm most interested in seeing and photographing. Lake Erie presents endless photographic opportunities as well, including the numerous lighthouses and breakwaters along its shores. The Lorraine West Breakwater Light can provide some spectacular icy views. And sometimes, as with this shot of the Marblehead Lighthouse, your favorite will be the one you took with your phone to send to family and friends. On occasion, the easy photo from the overlook offers a very nice composition, like this view of the West Falls of the Black River from the viewing, viewing platform at Cascade Park in Illyria. But the nearby East Falls is best viewed after a scramble down to river level. This is one of several waterfalls in our area that includes a man-made dam built atop a natural waterfall. Another such waterfall is Mudbrook Falls in Cuyahoga Falls, which also features State Road running directly above it and a car wash and houses on either side of it. People have used and abused our waterways for many years, but despite the bridges and dams and traffic and trash and graffiti, there's still beauty to be found here. For example, Chair Factory Falls is named for a factory along Jordan Creek in Lake County that has long since disappeared, proving that we can return these areas to a more natural state and Stony Brook Falls in the Penitentiary Glen Reservation is on the property of the former summer home of the Halley Department Store family and is now within a public park. With proper respect of and care for these sites, we can continue to enjoy the tranquility of a waterfall in the woods in Thompson Township, or a sunset over Sunny Lake in Aurora. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, fantastic images. And, and Bob is certainly one of our Ohio um, top waterfall photographers and appreciate sharing that. Next up, we have Vijay. I'm going to make a presentation on African photos from his safari. Vijay? Yeah, thanks, uh, Steve. Good evening, everyone. Uh, today, I'll be talking about my trip to Africa in 2016. I visited three parks during the trip, Chobe National Park, Okawanga Delta in Botswana, and Truga National Park in South Africa. I'll be presenting photos of the African animals, especially the big five. I had two camera bodies and two lenses. I had a 28-300mm lens and 150-500mm lens. 
Okay, let's get started. Okay, here in this uh, photograph, uh, you can see how close the animals are to the safari vehicles and people. You don't need long zoom lenses to take pictures. Either normal or wide angle lens work very well. I wish I had a wide angle lens here to capture the animal. And uh, we had a herd of elephant. Uh, we followed this herd of elephant that were running uh, to a water hole for water. And you can see the dust the elephants were creating. And there were nearly 30 to 40 elephants in this group. All right, here we caught up with the elephant and the elephant have reached the water hole and we were on the other side of this water hole and I took this photograph before they started drinking water and uh, the water was very still and the reflection of the elephant, the sky and the trees were perfect and uh, I took a lot of photographs there. So in this photograph, you can see a herd of buffaloes uh, about 50 to 60 grazing. And this was early in the morning during sunrise. And they're widely regarded as the, one of the most dangerous animals on the African continent. So this is part of big five too. And uh, on the other side of the grassland where the buffaloes were grazing, there were four lions just sitting and listening. The early morning sunlight made it a nice lighting for to capture this photograph here. So after uh, a while, uh, waiting for like half an hour, uh, the lions got up and walked towards bushes where some of the buffaloes had moved. Uh, the lions tried to hunt one of the buffaloes, but the buffalo escaped. The buffaloes run pretty fast, so they were not able to get their food. In this uh, slide, you see eight giraffes walking. This was just behind our lodge. I could come out of our lodge and find many animals um, just outside the lodge. We were warned not to walk too far from the lodge as we could encounter lions and elephants. In this uh, photo, um, you can see the common impala, photo taken in early morning. And this is probably um, an immature or uh, baby impala. Um, it's a medium-sized antelope. It's very common in South Africa, and they're almost everywhere. In this picture, you see a kudu with elephant in the background. And they have a narrow body with long legs. And they possess 4 to 12 vertical white stripes along the torso. They look like an adult male because of the large horn. Next uh, three photos are from Okavanga Delta. Here we did the food safari with uh, two guides. Here is the black backed jackal. It is nature, uh, it is uh, natural native to South Africa, South Africa. It's a fox like animal with a reddish brown coat and a black uh, saddle. So in this picture, we have um, a hyena. And uh, so we were surprised by four spotted hyenas hiding in the bush. And they tried to run away from us. And hyenas are very uh, important in the um, African ecosystem. And this another picture uh, I was able to capture, um, which, uh, which was trying to get away from of a group of uh, six or seven people, we were just walking around. So um, here uh, you can see the uh, elephant walking uh, among the um, grass there. And uh, we were able to see uh, lions, uh, elephant, buffaloes and all that when we were on foot and we were at a distance when we were walking there. The next few pictures are from Kruger National Park. And uh, here you can see the hippopotamus baby and adult. Uh, they were just getting out of the water hole 
and uh, this is uh, one supposed to be the third largest type of land mammal after elephant and rhinoceros. And in this picture, you can see the giraffe is trying to drink water. It is not easy for them to drink water and their neck is too short to reach the ground. So they have to spread their legs and bend down in an awkward position. And that makes them vulnerable to predators. And in this picture, there was a whole uh, pride of lions uh, just sleeping, uh, probably after their um, uh, good uh, uh, lunch or something. Uh, so this lion was sleeping with its pride and uh, it just got, uh, it just woke up and looked at us briefly when we just got there. And uh, here you can see the white rhinoceros, baby and adult. This is one of the big five animals. They have a herbivorous diet, small brain for mammals of their size, and they have two horns, and uh, adult rhinos have no real predator. Like in this picture, you'll see the yellow baboon. Uh, the uh, hairless face is black. They have slim body, white long arms and legs, and uh, they have a long tail, which is nearly as long as their body. In this slide, uh, you see the blue uh, wild bee um, belonging to the antelope family. Uh, their major predators that feed on wild bees include lions, cheetah, leopard, crocodile, African wild dogs and all that. And they run pretty fast and uh, in this slide, you see the hyena, um, the spotted hyena. It's eating a dead animal. Uh, they are tame scavengers, and there were two hyenas, and they were taking turns. And there were uh, vultures waiting for their turn uh, for the hyenas to leave. This is the last slide, and it's a photo of two cheetah cubs. They were in cap uh, captivity, probably rescued. And uh, so they were looking at us and uh, was able to capture their pictures. And uh, so this is the last slide. Thank you. Thank you very much, VJ. Looks like a really fantastic trip. And I have to tell you, I'm totally jealous. <laughs> a, a bucket list uh, trip uh, that I'd love to enjoy some time also. Next up, we have Randall Dunn. Let me remind people again for to pay attention to their muting of their microphones and unmuting when it's your turn. So uh, Randall is going to have some images he's going to present and show us water abstracts. Randall? Good evening. Springtime in the Smokies is magical, and the color palette includes every shade of green that you can imagine. Mix the green foliage reflected in crystal clear mountain water a blue sky, late afternoon light, using a slow shutter speed, and pecha kucha. Let's get started. I was in the Greenbrier section of the Great Smoky Mountain National Park and working a section of water directly above a small waterfall. I concentrated on the ripples in the water that were created by rocks close to the surface or changes in the current adjacent to the waterfall. Most of the images were created on Friday afternoon, April 30th this year. I went back the following day and made some images, but the mood wasn't the same. On the first day I was there, I was with a small group who were on a photo workshop. We stayed at this one location for about three hours so everyone could be immersed in their creative zones. I was certainly in my zone, so I decided to return the following day by myself after the workshop concluded. So, so, since it was a nice Saturday afternoon, this quiet area turned into the local swimming hole for about three families and a dozen kids who were in the water above and below the waterfall. Although I did create some good images, I never found that zone to continue pushing the limits of my creativity. My technique was to look for patterns and the ripples and experiment with different shutter speeds. The sweet spot for most of the images was between a quarter and one second using a medium telephoto lens and no filters. I processed the images in Lightroom using several different camera profiles with a bias towards Fujifilm simulations. Global and local adjustments varied based on my vision for the final image. 
Enjoy the rest of the show.
Thank you, Randy. Those are beautiful abstracts. Some of those colors and textures, I think, are just absolutely mesmerizing. And I have to say, I felt that, you know, in our cacophonous world, there's something very pleasant about just watching those abstracts in silence. I appreciate that. Next, we have Joe Blanda. He's going to talk to us about Appalachia. So, Dr. Blanda. Thanks, Steve. Greetings, everyone. Uh, I'd like to share uh, my experience with uh, exploring the Southern Appalachian Mountains. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, this nearby destination was a good place to socially isolate and uh, also very therapeutic. So let's get started. Time in nature is therapeutic. Studies show it strengthens your immune system, which can help fight off virus infections. Nature can help us heal, so we need to help nature heal. Not only does time in a biodiverse environment help fight depression and anxiety, but there are many research studies that show it decreases your risk of diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, and yes, virus infections. Get a kid interested in nature photography also. It's possible to beat the crowds in the Smokies. Big Creek Campground is in the lightly traveled northeast corner of the Smokies. It's a great tent camping spot and a great place for fly fishing in solitude. As many of you, as many, uh, of you know, Glade Run Gristmill in Babcock State Park offers many photo ops. I often struggle with the balance between water and the surrounding landscape, but here found the trees frame things pretty well. I really enjoy finding fractal patterns in nature, like the grain on the rock in the bottom right. As far as finding these waterfalls, Kevin Adams' book on North Carolina waterfalls is very good. I'm anxious to return to this one in hopes of finding better foliage color. If you want solitude, try Daniel Boone National Forest in Kentucky. However, it was sad to see how acid rain from fossil fuel emissions had damaged this stream. All you need to notice is the absence of aquatic insects. Only acid rain or illegal dumping of fracking waste can do that. This clean watershed holds some nice native wild trout. I couldn't get to the bottom of the waterfall, so I decided to try and highlight the leaves and trees with the water in the background. And the side lighting seemed to help. Sometimes it pays to look around move slow, be aware of your surroundings. Mindfulness is healthy. Nature photography, especially macro photography, has taught me to be more mindful, which can have many therapeutic benefits. One of the many benefits of enjoying the miracles of spring in the Appalachian Mountains is you get to come back to Northeast Ohio and enjoy it again. In some parts of the North Georgia mountains, dogwood blossoms occur as early as four weeks before ours do. In the Southern mountains, there are many back roads to lead you to new places to explore. I usually have a plan for the day, but sometimes my best shots come when I'm wandering around. Just be careful if you have a Biden or clean energy bumper sticker on your car. In 1978, my botany professor in college told me there was a wildflower with my last name in it. He didn't know my mother's first name was Violet. So that began my search for Violet Blandas, and that remains a special find for me each spring. I'm relatively new to wildflower photography, but enjoy the challenge. I stumbled upon this pink lady slipper while camping in Vogel State Park in North Georgia. Their numbers are decreasing due to overharvesting, acid rain, and loss of habitat. 
The Appalachian Mountains in South Carolina are often overlooked. This bashful wake robin was found near, near Devil's Fork State Park. Maybe some of you have made the pilgrimage there to photograph the rare Oconee Bell, which I've been late for two years in a row now. When I get wanderlust, I crave the four W's of the Appalachian Mountains, warblers, waterfalls, wildflowers, and wild trout. This Swainson's warbler was photographed near our newest national park, the New River National Park. I especially enjoy seeing birds in the Southern Mountains a month before they make it up here, or in the case of this worm-eating warbler, seeing the few migratory birds that don't make it up to Northeast Ohio. The oven bird got its name from its nest, which is a leaf covered dome resembling a Dutch oven. Its song is the loudest of all warblers, even resulting in a 1916 Robert Frost poem. The variety of bird song on any of the Appalachian mountain trails never ceases to amaze me. Even when photographing birds that are standing still, it pays to have a minimum shutter speed of 250 to freeze their moving beak or sudden movements. I told my daughters that they must pick a college within 45 minutes of the four W's. Unfortunate one daughter picked Wake Forest University and now lives in Atlanta. She knows why it takes me four or five days to get from here to visit her. Lots of stops. The Southern Mountains have many unexpected photo ops. This red trillium and Jack in the pulpit was a wonderful surprise for me. The sunlight moved in before I could get a better composition and I had ignored Jim Retzel's advice to always carry a diffuser. I'm grateful for the close proximity of these wonderful mountains and for the soothing sunsets, the enchanting bird song, the roar of the waterfall, and the whisper of the wind through the trees. And I'm most grateful for the opportunity to help try and preserve this gift. So get out there and do the same. Thank you very much, Joe, and love the re-emphasis and advice on the solace and mental health benefits of nature, and thus the importance of protecting these areas that are so valuable to us. Appreciate that. Next, we have Jake Waller, who's going to talk to us about water of the Eastern United States. Jake. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, I just wanted to yeah, rephrase. I'm going to be talking about water of the Eastern United States. And I'm Jake. Here's my Instagram handle if any of you are into that. Um, but yeah, I'm a geologist at the University of Akron going for my master's degree. So some pictures that are from geology trips and some of them are just from personal trips. So uh, let's check them out. This one is uh, from the Yellowstone, uh, Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. So it's sneaky. This is not the Eastern of the United States, but the rest are, I promise. So let's check them out. All right, so this first one is the Great Falls of Tinker's Creek. We've already seen it in this presentation. Um, in the winter. This was a summer day uh, right after an, a storm with uh, lots of flow and we saw kayakers and this is the first time I had uh, gone there and seen kayakers. Apparently that's a popular thing but it's really cool. This is Dundee Falls also which was in this presentation but this is a different aspect. This is really dark. When I went with my brother it was really foggy and really dark and you can kind of see the light shine through the trees. It's really beautiful. Um, and that's a good location if you can check it out. The next one is Honey Run Falls, kind of near Columbus, a little bit closer than Columbus, but they have ledges there like Ritchie Ledges in Cuyahoga Valley National Park and lots of cross stratification, which is really cool. Um, and this waterfall was flowing really nicely, is really nice. Um, lots of cool geology there. This is called Big Creek. Um, 
This is funny to me because, you know, creeks are generally smaller than rivers. But when I went here, uh, it had rained really hard the previous day. And there's lots of sediment in the water. So we couldn't even see the structure we were trying to find. But it looks like a river. So it's Big Creek. Um, this is Mill Creek Falls near Cleveland. This reminds me of the Smoky Mountains, actually. I've been there twice. And after the first round, I of going to the Smokies, I came here and I was like, oh my goodness, this is so reminiscent of the Smoky Mountains. And it's right next to Cleveland. So you check this place out, it's really cool. Mill Creek Falls, wear boots and prepare to walk in the river. So this is the Ritchie Ledges um, at Coyote Valley National Park. Uh, my talk is featuring water. And so this is, we're talking about ice and snow. So water is really important in geology. Um, and lots of freeze thaw erosion happens and that is partially why we can have this crack in here where you can walk. Uh, this is Wingfoot Lake at, um, at Wingfoot Lake State Park and this was the night of my cousin's wedding and it was really beautiful sunset really good to um, end the day here. Really beautiful with the reflection. The next state I'm going to talk about is New York. So the most of these pictures in New York are um, along the Genesee River in Letchworth State Park. So in Letchworth, uh, there's lots of waterfalls. Primarily, three are most famous, and it's the Upper and Middle and Lower Falls. So this is the Upper Falls, and we'll be going downstream and seeing the next two. Here's the Middle Falls. This one's the, uh, in my opinion, the most grandiose and has the most flow. I mean, they all kind of have the same flow. It's really close, but with it being wide, it looks really cool. Um, at this park in particular, they do hot air balloon um, like lifts over the falls that people can ride hair, hot air balloons. So this is the lower falls of that river. It's downstream, like I think a mile and a half or something, but it's really, really nice all throughout the area. Lots of waterfalls that are not these three, but these are the three most significant. Um, so if you're planning a trip, maybe look up when the hot air balloon thing is, because that would be cool. This is Inspiration Point at that park. And you can see the upper falls in the back and middle falls. And then if you would continue downstream, you'd see the lower falls. But this is right uh, where you'd see the first two. And it's uh, at a sunset for Inspiration Point. This is a really nice place. Uh, adjacent to that park, there's this waterfall called Wiskoy Falls, and there's actually an upper Wiskoy Falls, which you can see in the very, very back. Um, but then there's several drop-offs, and we didn't even know about this. Our Airbnb person was like, you're coming to Letchworth and you're not checking out Wiskoy Falls? So we went there, and that was really, really nice. Here's another place um, within Letchworth State Park in New York. This is Archery Field. There's a nice field right where you're taking, like where I was taking the picture, but you get a really nice view of a meander bend in the river. Um, so we have the river cutting through dolomite here, which is really cool. This is the same dolomite that uh, is at Niagara Falls. So very interesting. The next thing is Wolf Creek. This is also in Letchworth State Park. There's a really awesome waterfall that flows into the Genesee River here, but um, this is the top part of it. The bottom part is more impressive, but it's harder to get a picture of. So here's what here's what I got, and it's it's still good. Um, next thing is Kentucky. So this was in the Daniel Boone National Forest. Like uh, someone mentioned it recently. Um, this is Cumberland Falls. This is one of the most interesting waterfalls to me because it's one of two places in the world that consistently has moon bows. So lunar rainbow. All right, next is the Greenbrier area of Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Uh, I would definitely say this is one of the most underrated parts of the National Park. Almost everyone drives through Newfound Gap Road, and that's where you can get to lots of things. But Greenbrier was totally awesome. If you're going, I would totally recommend it. Next thing is Grotto Falls. This waterfall is actually the only waterfall you can walk behind in the Smoky Mountains or in both within the park boundaries, at least. Um, so you can't see it from this vantage point, but the trail goes right behind the falls and it's really cool. Uh, lots of people there to get a picture. So here's another one that's not really a waterfall or a river, but water is still important to lots of things, right? So the water is on plants and 
this is actually on the Appalachian Trail going to a location called the Jump Off. But when we went, the Smokies were being smoky. And so we actually did not get to see anything off of the viewpoint, but we still got lots of cool views on the trail. So this is the Roaring Fork Motor Trail. This is one of the um, biggest tributaries into, I think, the Little Pigeon River. But there's tons of little waterfalls along this uh, motor trail. So you drive your car around here. And then the last thing, the piece de resistance is in North Carolina. This is actually on the border of North Carolina and South Carolina. And there's an upper falls and a lower falls downstream from here. This is the upper falls. And it's 411 feet. It's the highest waterfall in all of um, the Eastern US, east of the Rockies. And that's it. So thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Jake. Um, a very interesting images, number of places where I certainly need to put on my list that I've never visited. And I don't know how often we have uh, presentations where people point out dolomite and anticlines and cross-hatching. So appreciate your geological perspective. Very nice. Uh, next up, we have Ken Bush, and he's going to make a presentation to us on hummingbirds. Ken? Good evening, and thanks for the invitation. I have professionally photographed people and events for decades. After retiring, I turned my photographic passion towards nature. A few years ago, I created a backyard garden studio to attract hummingbirds. This is one of the first ones I photographed. Let's get started. Nature has designed this trumpet honeysuckle blossom to be a perfect fit for a hummingbird's bill. Hummingbirds don't suck nectar, but they lap it up at 15 times per second with very long forked tongues. One side effect of a snug fitting blossom and sticky nectar is that sometimes an older blossom can detach from the stem and become stuck in a hummingbird's bill. Fortunately, a downward twist of the head can dislodge it within a few seconds. A hummingbird wings beat between 50 and 200 flaps per second. The rate depends on the direction of flight, the purpose of their flight, and the surrounding conditions. A cloud of pollen is seen above this hummer in air currents created by her hovering. An immature male ruby-throated hummingbird with dark streaking on his neck seems to have a lipstick kiss on his throat, but it is actually showing just two red gorget feathers of what will eventually become his namesake ruby throat. This male hummingbird is in the middle of his stretching routine. During his courtship flight, the males will fly back and forth in front of the female with 200 wing beats per second. Stretching their muscles is so important. Little Mo was a young male hummingbird that often visited my garden. When he retracted from the cardinal flowers, his head feathers would always get pulled up by the stigma of the blossom, giving him the look of a mohawk haircut. The name stuck and he became my favorite. <laughs> Little Mo finds a way to rest while he feeds from his favorite cardinal flowers. These birds have evolved smaller feet to be lighter for more efficient flying. Hummingbirds' feet are so small that they only use them for perching, scratching, and nest building. Hummingbirds do not have a keen sense of smell and rely on bright colors to find their food. They go to the dark center of sunflowers for their numerous tubular-shaped structures loaded with nectar, eating almost constantly. They visit over a thousand flowers a day. Moving from flower to flower, they appear to almost levitate, hovering in midair, practically motionless, except for the blur of their wings. For those who seek them, the humming sound made a clue to their presence. A fourth color cone type in the hummingbird's eye allow the birds to see in extra colors, tinted in ultraviolet. 
hummingbirds can detect UV, allowing them to see the world in colors that humans can't even imagine. Lichens are found growing on trees or shrubs. It is a good nesting material because they are tiny, strong for their weight, waterproof, and easy for a hummingbird to manipulate. Because they provide good camouflage, lichens are mostly used on the outside of the nest. Hummingbird nests are compact cups with spongy floors. Using spider silk as threads, they quickly weave vegetation to bind their nests together and anchor them to branches, soft, stretchy, and durable, the perfect qualities for the nest of tiny chicks. After a short trip to feed, a hummingbird mom returns to her eggs, incubating her eggs from 11 to 18 days. Most often, hummingbirds lay two eggs. The eggs are normally laid on different days and are about the size of a jelly bean. Both eggs will hatch together, even though they are not laid on the same day. When the mother returns to the nest, her little ones feel the wind from her wings and instinctively lift their heads and open their mouths. She feeds her young every 20 to 30 minutes all day. Hummingbirds are born naked without any downy feathers. It's only after about 10 days that they'll grow pin-like feathers that look a bit like porcupine spines. They're also born with short beaks that develop into the long pointed beaks of their parents. Two hummingbird chicks stretch their bodies as they see mom approaching, trying to reach mom to be the first to eat. As they compete, they test the limits of the nest, now stretched to maximum size. Hummingbirds grow fast. At about three weeks old, they have all their feathers and they can fly. The mother hummingbird continues to care for her young for another week after they have left the nest. Captured here is the first flight of one of the fledglings from the nest. In good light, male rufous hummingbirds glow like coals. They have the longest migration of any hummingbird species from breeding in Alaska to wintering in Mexico, over 2,000 miles in one direction. Of all hummingbirds in the North American West, this is the species most likely to be spotted in the Northeast. Rufous hummingbirds can adapt well to just about any environment. This one was visiting Holmes County, Ohio. Hard to find in the wild, a Canada lily was growing along the trail in the CVNP. A female ruby-throated hummingbird comes to feed. The similar shape of her wings to the lilies is captured with a shutter speed of one two thousandth of a second. Thanks for watching. Wow, that's all I can say is wow. Thank you for those beautiful images. Um, uh, I have to say that I just wish some of those shots were mine and extremely informative. Thank you for all that information about hummingbirds. Actually, it's a real testament about some of the ways you can set up your own yard to capture images. So thank you, Ken. Absolutely. Next, we have Chris Brown, who's going to talk to us on the theme of H2O. Chris? Chris, are you there and unmuted? More chance for Chris. Make sure you're unmuted. Okay. Um, seems that Chris maybe uh, is unable to connect right now. So let me jump ahead. Maybe we can come back to Chris. Forward. So 
Sorry about the delay. Going to go to Janine, I believe, will be next. Okay, can you hear me again? Can you hear you again? It's uh, taken because it's a large file, it's taken just a second to go into presentation mode here. Okay, hopefully we're working. Okay, great. Well, hello everyone. Um, I just wanted to say that although I studied photography at Ohio University in Athens when I was in school there 40 years ago, I didn't become serious about photography until 2003 when I took a week long workshop at Yellowstone. I joined this club in 2006 and started my own photography business in 2012. I sell my work online at my website um, at juried fine art festivals in Ohio and at Heights Arts, a gallery in Cleveland Heights that represents me. I also have a corporate presence and I've done philanthropic work with my photography. Um, and about this um, presentation of the beauty of Cleveland, um, I thought, of a quote from John Severance, who was the um, patron of the arts who gave $2.6 million to create Severance Hall, the home of the Cleveland Orchestra. And he said, things that are beautiful and helpful to the cultural life of a community are an outstanding pleasure of life. And I thought it's important to remember that things are beautiful. And as all of these images have shown, life in the world is beautiful. At the same time, it's important to recognize that we humans are the most destructive as well as the most creative species. And it may seem as if we're bent on our own destruction at the moment, hurtling towards extinction, fully prepared to take all other living species with us. We still will have left traces of our presence in our wake, some of which are beautiful. And so these images reflect some of what I believe is beautiful about the city of Cleveland, where I have had a home for 23 years, a home that I now share with my husband of almost two years. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, these hiking boots were my first hiking boots that I bought in 2003 before my trip to Yellowstone, and they reflect where that workshops with CBPS and photo walks and everything have taken their toll on since I joined the club in 2006. And I had to retire them in 2017 um, and love them. Okay, so this is Cleveland Public Library and uh, I get a lot of my books and music uh, from the library. It's a great resource. And in 2016, they had a public art installation um, showing recycled plastic animals. And it was really cool. These are sculptures by Tom Otternus. He's a public artist, a sculptor who has work um, in subways in um, different museums and things or, or outdoor art. And I think they're really lovely because they're primitive and yet very expressive. And they're outside of the library. Um, these are bridges that lead to the mouth of the Cuyahoga as it, as it is, joins the um, Lake Erie. So these are um, bridges over the Cuyahoga. Um, these are the guardians of transportation, otherwise known as the guardians of traffic. Uh, I took these photos in May and June. Um, those of you who follow sports will know that the Cleveland Indians just renamed themselves the Guardians and some people love the idea and some people are vociferously against the idea, but nevertheless, at least it's not a racist, <laughs> a racist name and they're protectors and they're, they're on the um, Carnegie Lorraine Bridge just next to um, the stadium. So they were Art Deco inspired um, 
statues that uh, were built in 1932, finished in 1932, and um, there's eight of them. And they are all carrying different forms of transportation. There's a hay wagon, there's uh, a passenger car, there's a covered wagon, um, stagecoach, and they're just very regal, I think. Um, many of the workers were, were Italian immigrants who settled in Little Italy. And there's eight of them. There's uh, four that face east and four that faced west. Um, this is just fireworks over Cleveland um, that I took with the Cleveland Photographic Society uh, on July 4th, a couple years ago. This is the chandelier, again, either beloved or hated by many. Um, it was built by GE, it's 20 feet tall, purportedly the largest outdoor chandelier in the world. I didn't fact check that, but I think it is. Uh, installed in 2014, built by a lighting manufacturer from Montreal, has 4,200 crystals and 68 GE LED lights, but it only costs thousand dollars a year to light the entire structure. Okay, the Cavs played a game this night, January 2nd, 2016, they won. LeBron scored 29 points and it was, Cleveland beating the Orlando Magic for a 13 straight win, 104 to 79. Here's Cleveland Museum of Art. Um, so I love the art museum and it's free. It's one of the largest art museums in the world that's actually free to the public, which is fantastic. And it has a fantastic collection. And this is a picture of the, um, of the Rodin sculpture, the thinker. Um, which of which there are 25 in the world, 10 of which were supervised by, by Rodin, of which this is one. It was destroyed by a bomb in 1970, but the museum decided to keep it in its destroyed state and not to try to repair it. No one was arrested for the bombing and no one knows uh, who, who did it. This is um, Frank Geary's, uh, the architect's um, building at Case Western Reserve University, the management school. Um, so Gary is one of the most famous contemporary architects and his use of corrugated steel, chain link fencing, unpainted plywood and other utilitarian, utilitarian everyday materials um, were inspired by him spending Saturday mornings at his Russian Jewish grandfather's hardware store in Brooklyn. And I like this image because it looks like writing to me. I think that the way the light played on the steel looks like writing. That's my house, our house, my husband and I, Bernie, my husband and I. So it's a Victorian era, uh, 1866 house representative of houses in Ohio City where we live um, and we love the house. There's Severance Hall, um, like I said, uh, built by John Severance. The interior, it's a real gem and the interior is patterned after 18th century British lace, uh, which was the pattern of John Severance, Severance's wife's wedding dress. She died young and he, um, he used the pattern of her dress to honor her in the hall. Um, here is the Cleveland skyline or part of it taken from the West Bank of the Flats. This is Cleveland uh, shot from Tremont. And the terminal tower shot from Whiskey Island. That's it. 
Thank you, Janine, for depicting some of the beauty of Cleveland and, and again, full of uh, some great information and facts. Uh, that was very interesting. Appreciate that. Um, let me ask first if, if uh, Jim Rudick is on with us. Jim, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? I, I can. Um, I'm going to I'm going to jump ahead to yours because I know Leslie is actually on the road and she's done a voice over PowerPoint that I'll try and get to. So um, let me jump ahead to yours, Jim. So glad we can have you joining us from Boston. Some of the beauty of a virtual presentation. We have people from all over the country with us. It's quite amazing how this is working out. Okay, share screen again. Can you hear me? Can hear you. And oh yeah, but I can't see anything, so. Okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna bring up, yeah, I'm gonna bring up the, uh, the title screen now, or as soon as it appears, I'll let you know, and then we'll be ready to start. And Jim is with us on the phone, so. We'll do the best we can. Okay, we've got the title screen up now, Jim. Okay, here goes. Well, hello, uh, my name is Jim Rubick. I'm an endocrinologist and so practice in Canton, but my passion is pretty much everything else. I've been a photographer most of my life, though when I never really had any formal training. And I see photography mainly as a way of telling stories. And until COVID hit, that meant traveling. Well, uh, one of my passions had been diving, but my last dive adventure, unfortunately, was a liveaboard in the Red Sea several years ago. But high on my bucket list was to have a close encounter with a huge, intelligent alien. And the dream, that dream finally realized in February 2019, when my brother-in-law joined me in Puerto Plata, that's in the Dominican Republic, where we reserved a, the last spot, actually, on a week-long adventure on the Explorer 2, which is a liveaboard ship operated by Tom Conlins and company, Aquatic Adventures. Well, the cabin was clean and rather small. It was the matrimonial suite, the last one they had available. So we shared a smallish double bed, and some of the other guests would give us some knowing looks. Well, the Silver Bank lies about 80 miles northeast of Puerto Plata in the Dominican Republic in the Atlantic Ocean. It's a submerged bank and coral reef that covers about 649 square miles in certain areas. And in certain areas, it's shallow, um, yeah, about 60 feet or so, with uh, some coral heads breaking the ocean, uh, ocean surface at low tide. And in 1996, this area was discovered was declared a sanctuary for marine mammals by Dominican presidential decree. Well, it's a unique place that creates a naturally protected area for the northern Atlantic humpback whales that migrate every winter to give birth. So. As autumn approaches, humpback whales from the western North Atlantic begin, begin approximately a 1,200 mile journey south to the various calving and mating grounds located throughout the uh, Ant Antilles. Well, heavily pregnant female humpbacks will give birth on average uh, on arrival in about 10 to 11 months gestation, while the males will start to seek out and compete for willing partners for mating. Well, the female humpbacks don't tend to mate every year, though they will come back into estrus shortly after giving birth. So the drive to reproduce makes a great deal of surface action as the males struggle for proximity to estrus females. And males become extraordinarily vocal at the time too with their plaintive songs that fill the shallow seas. So we departed Puerto Plata and we anchored at the Silver Bank, making twice daily excursions in an eight, in an eight passenger boat. Well, just like Captain Ahab, we'd spot whales by their V-shaped plumes. They could hold their breath about 40, up to 40 minutes, and their exhaled breath had been clocked at up to 300 miles per hour. So it was easy to spot them, and there were a lot of whales out there. And we then would race to meet them with masts and fins instead of harpoons. Well, often these whales and their calves would chase us or cruise under the boat. They seemed to be curious about us as we were with them. And they would beat their enormous 15-foot flippers rhythmically against the surface, perhaps just for show. Then they come up from below and spy hop, clearly for our benefit. Often they would leap completely out of the water, all 30 tons, and they and sometimes in tandem. 
well, there's four types of breaches and they're spinning breaches, chin breaches, tail breaches, and, and lunge breaches. And we saw all, all forms. Uh, they may be a form of solicitation, a warning device, a way to remove parasites, who knows? Or they must they might just be having fun. Either way, it's pretty impressive at close range. Well, the fluke or the tail fin of a humpback is very broad and flat, average 10 to 15 feet. And interestingly, they have a serrated edge and unique coloring of black and white markings on the tail, which makes it fairly easy to identify uh, individuals with photography. And a rowdy competitive group is when two or more males, usually males, compete for proximity to females in estrus. So they're, they're chasing the women. The rowdy groups are fast paced bursts of speed up to 12 miles at a time. They're energetic and often violent. And that's uh, it's a blast to, to, to follow these in a small boat. Well, chasing whales and having them chase us was indeed a thrill, but jumping into the water with them was something entirely different. So Tom essentially pioneered this effort. About 30 years ago, he discovered that humpbacks could be approached if it was done quietly and with great respect. Well, the silver bank is a place to rest and raise calves in preparation for the long northward migration to feeding grounds in, from Maine, Newfoundland, Labrador, Greenland, and Iceland, all the way to Scandinavia. So we would try to find a nursing mother and her calf actually resting in the shallow depths, often accompanied by a male suitor. And the object was to slip silently into the water as a group that slowly approached the whales. They would either swim away or ignore us or occasionally engage with us. The calves were very curious and playful. And one time I was watching a mother and her calf at the surface when Paul violently pulled on my fin, pointing down, and just below us was the male. And I was just able to snap a photo of his tail three feet from me as he slowly swam off. Well, these gentle monsters have an uncanny, uncanny special sense, a little nudge of that tail could have done some real damage, but they didn't. Uh, also, these encounters are very closely regulated by the Dominican uh, government, so uh, there's not too much pressure on the whales. They actually either ignore us or they enjoyed our company. There is 16 populations of humpbacks around the world. Four of them are considered endangered and one is threatened. But unlike most of the terrible environmental news, this one seems to be a success story. Because the global population has been rebounding since whaling was banned in the 70s. It's estimated now there's currently between 120 and 150,000 humpbacks. Well, humans are still the whale's biggest threat, either when they're struck by ships or entangled in commercial fishing gear. That's the problem. But I was really fortunate to have lost my camera gear on the plane. So the crew let me borrow this cute little Olympus TG6. It's an indestructible, indestructible little camera, waterproof to 50 feet with a 4X optical zoom and a 4K video. I had no need to bother with O-rings or histograms. I had more time to experience the whales. And all in all, this was a life-changing week. Mm -hmm. The phrase, we are all in this together, used to ring hollow. Now that I've met the island alien, I know we're pretty much the same. So if you're really interested in the ultimate whale photographer, there's a photo book by Brian Scarius, S-C-E-R-R-Y, will blow your socks off. There's also a four-part four part, uh, documentary uh, featuring this photography on the Disney Channel. Uh, I hope this has been interesting. Thanks for watching. Wow, that timing worked really well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rudick. Um, what a fantastic experience that must have been. I can't imagine um, doing photos of whales while you're in the water with them. Um, outstanding. For those who are interested in more, um, Jim also has really neat video of this adventure on his website and I encourage you to contact him for that. I'm going to now shift gears and open a different, a different uh, file. As I said, several of our members Okay, I stop my video. And I'm gonna open a file now where Leslie is literally driving right now. So she doesn't have access to the internet. So she created a voiced over PowerPoint and I'm gonna open that and share it and see if we can make this work. Ready to open. Okay, so that should be coming up now. 
And let's listen to the final presentation by Leslie Nutt on Hudson Springs Park. Hopefully this will work.
Well, I want to thank Leslie for putting that together for us, uh, even though she uh, couldn't physically be with us. Um, and remind us that photography can be not just informative, but very emotional also, and that's powerful for change. I'm going to do one last call for Chris. Chris Brown, are you with us on the call now? Okay, it seems it seems not. Um, so want to particularly thank all those who took the time and effort to put together their Pecha Kuchas. I've really enjoyed it. I hope some of you have also. We uh, see this potentially as ongoing. We wanna hear your feedback, whether you enjoyed that, whether you thought it was valuable. And if so, look forward to more people sharing their future Pecha Kuchas at other events. We, uh, I, th I think Bill may still be with us and remind, us about a couple of things. Bill, do you want to remind one more time about what's going on right now? Okay, again, right now we're, we're in the midst of our August photo walk. Um, and uh, that is uh, has a destination of the Brecksville Prairie that uh, will part continue on until uh, August 23rd. And then uh, a critique will take place on the uh, 25th of August. So I hope to see you, you all there. And um, based on what I've seen tonight, I hope uh, we have uh, lots of uh, more great images to be shared. So thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Have a great evening. Thank you.